Good morning and welcome to the Kellogg and Co podcast. This week we've finally had some more detail from Trump on his proposed corporate tax cuts for the US. During his campaign last year he did say he wanted to reduce US corporate tax to 15%. Since then we haven't heard a huge amount more about it and there was some doubt that he would be able to get this legislation through. This week he has come out with a more detailed plan saying he wants to now reduce corporate tax to 20%. Not quite as low a level as he originally said but still a significant reduction in the current rate of US corporate tax. This chart here shows the various rates of corporate tax that are paid by different countries around the world. As you can see, the US pays a tax rate of 38.9%, and that is the highest rate of corporate tax for any of the developed economies. The UK, as you can see, is far lower at 19%, and Ireland has a rate of just 12.5%, and that is the reason why a number of global and US companies do choose to have their headquarters in Ireland. The global average for corporate tax is 23%. As you can see, that is far below the US rate. So there would be a huge amount of benefit for American companies if Trump was able to get this legislation through. Now, different sectors do stand to benefit by different amounts if this legislation does, does go through. At the moment, US companies have to pay tax on their global earnings, but only if they take the money back to the US. At the moment, energy companies do tend to take most of their earnings back to the US, so they, they end up paying this huge tax bill on all of their earnings. Technology companies, in contrast, tend to hold a lot of their earnings offshore, therefore they don't pay the full US tax rate and a lot of the money they earn overseas. So if this legislation does go through, US energy companies probably would be the ones to benefit the most. So this week we have seen a bit of a rise in US energy stocks. Moving to the UK, we have had some more comments from Theresa May regarding Brexit. It does now seem that she is aiming for a slightly softer approach. Initially, she was very outspoken about wanting a hard Brexit and about removing us from the single market. Recently, she has spoken about having a transitional period. And just yesterday, she did a speech where she commented on going for a specific deal for the UK financial services sector. So this would be very beneficial for the UK economy. Not surprising that she wants to do this. UK financials are a very significant part of the UK economy. Last year, looking at exports from the UK to the EU, the total value of all goods and services exported was about £241 billion, and of that, financial services accounted for 23%. So that really is a very significant percentage, and it's not surprising that Theresa May wants to protect that proportion of our economy. So we will be watching closely to see how that progresses. Also in the UK this week, we've had some rather disappointing data regarding the housing sector. We do follow an index called the Nationwide House Price Index. It's a very widely followed and widely respected measure of house prices in the UK. There is one measure for the UK as a whole and also a separate measure for house prices in London. This chart here shows the two different price measures over the last 10 years. The green line relates to London, the pink line shows the whole of the UK. And what this is measuring is year-on-year -year house growth. So obviously with positive growth, that means that house prices are rising, Neg negative growth, that means that house prices are falling. As you can see, looking at the, the green line for London, this was the first month in which the growth level has gone below 0%. So that means that this is the first, mo first month since the financial crisis in which London house prices have fallen. So that is a bit of a concern. It's potentially due to concerns about Brexit, but also possibly due to concerns about the Bank of England pointing towards high interest rates in the future. Higher interest rates do tend to be negative for our house prices. So we will be watching this index closely over the following months. And lastly, in the UK this week, we're celebrating 20 years of independence for the Bank of England. Back in 1997, Gordon Brown gave the Bank of England complete independence over UK monetary policy and the interest rate. Before this, governments did have control over the interest rate, and there was speculation that they did manipulate this to make themselves look good before an election. For example, they might have lowered the interest rate in the run-up to an election. That would have boosted economic growth and perhaps made the public more likely to re-vote for that particular government during the next election. However, lowering the interest rates like this can cause big spikes in inflation. And prior to 1997, we did see a lot of volatility in the UK inflation rate over the longer term. However, since 1997, the Bank of England, with its independence, has aimed to keep inflation constant at a level of 2%. As you can see here, this chart says UK inflation since 1989. 
and as you can see, it has been much more stable since 1997. So this is very good for UK business and UK consumers. It does give them much more confidence in the stability of the UK economy over the longer term. Moving on to the week ahead, we have no stocks on the Killick buy list reporting, but Tesco will be releasing results, so we will be quite interested to see what those reveal. That's it from us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday.